spring and summer. We're going to do one seminar a month, and it's all on the topics of building a home. Uh, tonight, our topic is designer trends, and we have two of Central Ohio's finest custom home builders. We have two representatives here with Bob Webb Home, Scott and Dave, and we've got two representatives here. Design trends in uh, floor plans, and Lee and Brooke will be discussing design trends in surfaces, uh, such as countertops, flooring, the details of the home. So, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Scott and Dave. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Scott Shire with Bob Webb. And uh, I'm not going to do much talks this evening. I brought one of our architects, Dave Johnson, to do that. But first, I'd just like to thank Evans Farm for inviting us to be on the dock for the first time. I'm very excited to see what the Green Pillar presents so we can steal their designs from that side. I'm sure that is you pick them all. But in reality, it's kind of, I, I think Evans Farm is going to be one of the most exciting places that we've ever done business. Bob Webb has been building since 1960. You know, started a few communities that are well known, like Beer Fuels and so forth. Uh, which is, it's, it's very interesting because we're now back there, but uh, I've worked with Dave almost 20, I don't know how many years, 30 years, I guess. I'm embarrassed to say all the communities that were nothing, flat piece of ground, similar to whatever farm is to start out, that have turned into places like the lakes, Wedgwood, Tartan Fields. And if, if you look at how the design style has changed, I honestly believe it's changed more radically in the last five years or in the last 20 years. So with that being said, I'm going to introduce Dave Johnson, and he's going to take you through some of the, at least the interior design trends we're seeing. Dave. Hi, it's an honor to be here tonight to speak to you guys. I've been involved in residential home design for the last 30 years in Central Ohio. And um, we've really seen a big wave changes in the last three or four years. A lot of it, um, to be honest with you, a lot of the people you see on house.com, they watch home guard TV, and um, it's making builders respond to what people are seeing out there. And I, I really see interior design plan trends have really evolved quick, quickly. Usually it's over a 20-year period that you see a lot of these things happen. To me, I've really seen it over about a five year period. <laughs> so, what's really important about Evans Farms is harkening back to the traditional feel of architecture. Um, what's really important is how, how do you get a house that looks traditional, looks like it's been around for 100 years, that still responds to today's floor plan being the open concept that everybody wants, the nice wide concept of open areas. What we've done is taking traditional architecture and able to take those traditional forms of the front porch. And for example, this is a rendering um, that I did for a model that we just did up in Grove Village. West of Dublin, and what I've done is I've taken kind of a traditional carpenter object to look at the house. You could really take this house and put it right down in the middle of downtown Rambo. Carpenter object was very popular towards the end of the 19th century, and it just harkens back to Midwest values. Um, obviously, you're going to see front porches everywhere you go in these farms. The hard thing about it is traditional architecture was really first developed when the automobile wasn't as important as it is today. For example, you go to Clintonville, a lot of times you'll have a rear, rear garages or no garages at all, or an alley type garage. What's important today is to try to get you that feel, but still keep your garages so they're not a dominant part of the architecture. Go down the neighborhoods that were built in the 80s and stuff, you'll see the Car side little garages that stick out in front of the house and they dominate the whole house. The important thing about 
and I'm going to segue into the interior, is getting integrating your garages within a traditional form so they don't overpower your output. With that, we're going to start, I'm going to talk about a big trend that we've seen, and we actually kind of started this year, and I'll have to make presence of that, is the messy kitchen. When you think about your kitchen, you want a kitchen that if you're entertaining, you want a big party, you want to have a way to clear all the dishes and go to a place where you can stack them up. You might even have a second, a second uh, if you look right here, this is a little, we call it a little messy kitchen off the kitchen itself. What that does is you can have dry goods, pantry goods in there, but most, most importantly, you're going to have an area where you can have cabinets, and it's going to look good, but you could bring dishes and food and everything in there, stack it in there, close the door, and then your main kitchen stays nice and picked up and spruced up, and it just gives you a nice feel like you're not going to have to you know, take time away from the party to clean up the kitchen. You've got a messy kitchen back there. What's also great about that area is that's where you put all your stuff that you typically have to take out from underneath, put on your counter. Um, your curry, things that, your blender and stuff, those are things that can go back to the messy kitchen behind your formal kitchen. For example, you can have a dishwasher back there, you know, this is your curry and your extra sink and your dry goods. We put that on the other wall so you're not looking through and seeing it. And plus, it could be a very aesthetic part of your kitchen, even though you can close that off and it becomes a separate part that you don't have to worry about if you're doing a party or something. And this is something that people see that and they understand. It's hard to explain it, but once people see it, they really understand and they respond. To other this is a quick another great place to put. Um, additional appliances, another microwave, maybe this is where the kids go and maybe get to the microwave and use those and stuff. And then you can do that separate sink back there as a great place to have it. The next trend I want to talk about is outdoor living. Um, the big trend now in architecture is you want to blend the inside and outside. You want of those outdoor rooms, covered porches are really big now. And what that allows us to do is bring in extra things. You can do an outside TV, do a fireplace. What's great about this, I have a lot of clients that love, love the feel of a real fireplace, but they don't want to have a real fireplace in their, their main house because you can bring in you know, insects and dirt and, and wood and you have to deal with that. What's great about doing a covered porch with a fireplace that burns wood is you still get the feel that yeah, you know, I can have a traditional kind of fireplace sit around with and not have to worry about the smoke and the dust and everything going into your main house. So we're finding that's a big trend now. It becomes an outdoor, it really is the outdoor living room. And there's all sorts of um, things you can do to really make that even more where you can extend the season. We've, just, we've discovered that over the opening back here, there are products now, i.e. Um, phantom screen, where this is a screen product that drops down and you can use as that screen porch or keep it open in. And they also have an option where you can use a plastic pull down. Combine that with some heaters in your fireplace and you can extend your, extend your season in the outdoor living like nine, 10 months out of the year, especially, especially this winter, where um, you're, it really becomes uh, part of your house and clothes. Another important thing is we're seeing more of a trend to um, use type of a wind door or a western door or, or an accordion type door that opens your main living room, great room, to your outdoor living. And by incorporating, opening that wall, window wall up, and then using like a screen product, you can really lift the inside of your house, floor to the outside, and it really, it really allows you to enjoy the outside without insects and everything. It expands your space, it gives you more of a space to expand from your original living room. And 
this is another version where these are, these are zero lot line condos um, that you basically took your out, outside covered porch, added a fireplace, and we added your traditional grill, but it's got a hood to take care of spoke and everything. It becomes that outdoor kitchen as well as an outdoor living area when you're entertaining. And it provides an extra space within the home that you typically almost so it's almost an object about sometimes your outdoor porches you wouldn't use it as much, but if you're out kitchen with a bunch of amenities, it tends tends to get more use. Um, the next trend I'd like to talk about is the laundry room access. Um, we have a lot of couples who are they become empty nesters and they downsize. And a lot of times it's maybe two older people that are in the residence and the kids come by and they, they typically, will typically have a first floor master and we'll have three or four bedrooms upstairs. That's where the kids and their families come, like over Christmas they will live upstairs. And what we've done is we've taken the laundry room away from, say, the mud room off the garage and we've integrated it so that it's off walk-in closet of the master bedroom. This would be the master bedroom, your walk-in closet. And the laundry room integrates within the master bedroom walk-in closet, so you have access not only from the main parts of the house, but also from the, from the master bedroom suite as well. And it, it, it's great. You're getting ready in the morning, and you need to run and grab something from the washer or the dryer. Your, your laundry is right there. It, it's basically integrated you know, with, the, with the master back, back closet. We're finding a, a trend, especially with the empty nester um, clients that really appreciate almost like it becomes like a really like a super super master on screen. And this slide on the right, you can see uh, part of the laundry room and then integrates with the door open and integrates with the um, the walk-in closet or master. This is the view kind of from the laundry room into the walk-in closet. So um, the next thing I want to talk about is the family foyer. Um, there's a lot of things to be said for you're having a, a long, hard day at work and you come home. When you enter your house, you want to have a good feeling that a guest would have entering your main floor. You don't want to walk in from your garage to a messy room. For example, a lot, of, a lot of times in the past, you've done a big, usually the first space you enter is a laundry room in the garage. By doing a family foyer, there, there, it's a room that is picked up, it's organized, it's got cubbies in it. It makes you feel good when you come home. You don't want more stress when you come home into a messy space. First thing you see is, oh my God, I haven't done laundry in two weeks, and there it is, all stacked up. So what's great about the family foyer is it makes you feel as good as your main foyer feels, and it's just more of a functional space. And part of that space allows you to have cubbies, and this was from the, the 2016 freight home, the first slide that you guys saw, that was the uh, Bob Red freight home. And we've actually incorporated Pet Central area where you've got drawers that pull out for food, and you've got a little pen. A lot of people have pets, and they have maybe a visitor comes over that's either allergic to a cat or a dog. This is a great place you can integrate um, a cage that you can put a dog in temporarily to come over. And stuff. Or people even use that um, you know, right there at work. Sometimes they'll pen their animals if they're not having food. So this is part of the messy kitchen or the family foyer. What's great about this space, look at all the detailing that have gone into this space. You've got a brick floor, you've got all sorts of built-ins. You have hooks for coats and stuff. This space is as detailed as the other parts of the home. It still makes you feel special coming in, even though this may be a place where it's just you seeing it every day, not your, not your guest's first impression of your house. And you include the lighting, special lighting, and, and the hardware. So it's a space where a lot of times it's been kind of an afterthought and neglected, and we're taking advantage and putting some focus on that today. Another example of the family's boy with the integrated cousins. Um, 
this one is not if you just have a window to get some natural light in that space. The, the sky is the limit. We're actually now starting to see a trend. I don't have any slides of that right now, but one of our latest models, we're actually taking the cubbies and we're putting them into an alto. So no matter how, how much organization you give, kids are going to come, come by and they're going to throw their coats down and stuff. We found that we do like a little cubby alto and we're using like a barn door concept to close that in. We can even take that clutter of of the alcove and you can close that so you're not walking into your family foyer and see the clutter of the cubbies. You actually have a place where you can close that off as well. Another thing we, we're doing in the family foyer is integrating built-in drawers and, and counter space and everything. A lot of times what I'll, I'll do is I'll design what is a mail drop, mail coming in and out. Um, three or four years ago, it was it was the um, your, the trend was to put um, USB outlets and everything is where you put your phone when you came in. The thing is, when people people now don't don't get rid of their phone, they have their phone on them almost twenty four seven. You're not going to leave your phone here. So now these these spaces are more of a mail drop where bills come in and go out, and um, it's less of a charging station. Next thing I want to talk about is a lower level bar. Um, we're finding that people want to maximize all levels of the home. And the old days of a finished basement where you have the land ceiling and the paneling are long gone. I mean, the detail level of lower lower levels has really has really gone exponentially. And this this is designed to entertain. In fact, this is not a typical bar. This becomes a serving bar. You've got a place where you can ice champagne, wine. Um, the bar integrates cooling um, refrigerators for beer and wine in the back. And it's designed for entertaining in a level of your home that typically was the old rec room. Now it's becoming a place where we're, we're doing full design in, in bars, uh, basement kitchens. We're also seeing a trend as well to go from, let's say, an eight to nine foot height in basements to going to a 10 foot foot wall height to get people extra space. And that helps when you have drops and stuff. It gives, it gives the ceiling height even though you may have some areas where you've got drop and so on. There's another version of a smaller bar or a traditional um, bar where people can sit there and serve come from behind integrating the wine and countertops. <clears throat> and be surprised how many places now we're adding flat screen TVs. And the, usually in a basement like this you'll, you'll see maybe two or three flat screen TVs in different locations throughout the basement. Another thing, a trend is to dress up the drop beams. For example, in this in this model what we've done is we've done heavy timber wood. They kind of give the feel like it's an old house that was kind of, kind of built with timbers to hold the rest of the house up. It's those little touches that, especially I think in the ambiance of Evans Farm, that people walk in and they're like, yeah, when was this house really built or was this a renovated house? There's certain details with the brick walls and everything that kind of give that a reclaimed, renovated look to it and give the house kind of a, kind of a built-in history. Kind of neat, there's neat touches, and you have a lot of different varying. What's great about it is you have the shininess of a quartz or a granite countertop with kind of the rough, roughness of the brick and stuff. I, I like that play of shiny. And, and, yeah, sure. The question about the brick on the floor and the brick on the wall mm -hmm. is it it's like a product that is a thin product? Right, it's a thin, it's a thin brick, so we don't have the issue of structure. And everything. What's great about that? Once you do your mortar joints and everything, you have no idea that it's not a full four inch thick brick. So it's it's a great way to bring that texture in, and it's real brick. It's just a thin. Another 
thing we're seeing in those lower level basements is um, a place where a wine bar we use. You know, this is not a big space. It's, it's, it's like you know, four by seven. But it's got a glass door, so it's a it's a neat display of the wine. And sometimes you can actually climb and control some of these rooms too. If, when people are really into the wine and keeping at a certain set temperature. The last thing I want to talk about are 12 foot living areas. Um, we're finding that literally the trend in the last five years is we've gone from a typical nine foot first floor ceiling to to a 10 foot ceiling, we're finding that if you go from a 10 to 12 foot ceiling, the impact the impact of going from 10 foot to 12 foot is amazing. People walk in and they're just just floored at the feel of the spaciousness of a 12 foot ceiling. If you ever walk into an old Victorian at the turn of the century, typically you'll have mostly 12 foot ceilings in some of the older houses. And a lot of times the taller ceiling was, um, it served a function because back then a lot of times you used gas lighting to light a home. And a lot of times the higher the ceiling, the more chance you feel you smell the fumes of the gas lighting. What's great about the 12 foot ceiling is it allows us to get some high glass that lets light in, like for example, in this kitchen above the kitchen cabinets, and allows us to get these window walls of glass with full transom windows over six foot windows. And then by doing that, you could fur down with some, for this paper work that is a, is a stained copper ceiling. So it allows you to play around with your ceiling heights when you go to a 12 foot ceiling. The days of the two, of the two story ceiling space to me, that screams McMansion. And Kevin's Farms is everything but a McMansion. It harkens back to a traditional kind of architecture. What's also great about a 12 foot ceiling is you do have the opportunity to put living space over your 12 foot ceiling and not feel like it's way up in the air. Um, what I usually have done is if the rest of the house is 10 foot, we'll put bedrooms, main bedrooms, and for example, if there's a master, you'll have another area where you go up three steps, and then the master could conceivably build your 12 foot living areas. And for example, if you're in the back of the woods, that really gets you a great view out the back if you have your master upstairs. And then it allows you to stack some space spaces over the 12 foot ceiling. <coughs> another trend, I don't have any slides of that, is to go to a vaulted ceiling, but it's more of where the walls start at 10 to 12 feet and they slope up to a peak in that room. And a lot of times what we're doing is embellishing that peak with, with trusses, with like a heavy timber barn trusses. And that also gives that whole look of, you know, and look this house built, you know, got a lot of these traditional details in there. And just, it, it help, helps the house kind of tell the story. Mm -hmm. This is a, uh, another view of a 12 foot ceiling um, where you can look through. We even, we literally took all the walls out of this first floor. You see this, this is a ranch with um, steps that lead to a basement. Typically you'd see a wall here and a wall here bracketing where those stairs are. By opening up that part of the house that typically would have walls, you introduce these amazing views. This is a combination of a wide open concept without walls and the 12 foot ceiling. And it really, the house has a traditional exterior. You walk in, it almost feels like it almost has a New York type loft feel to it because you know, all the areas are really great where you can look into the dining area and the living room and the kitchen areas. And you also can see the light, the windows above the cabinet. Advantage of the 12 foot ceiling in this regard, too. So that's the end of my slides. Uh, I can take any other questions. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
while we're getting up and running in Evans Farm. Um, as uh, Andrea said, my name is Lee Salamides. Uh, this is the builder, this is Zenyos, who's the owner of uh, Three Pillar Homes, President and Owner. So we welcome you to visit us um, until Evans Farm is mucked and painful and something you can come and see. We are located right next door in our model home at the Meadows Center. So we've been seeing some overflow of people coming here and then stopping over to kind of talk about the concepts that are on the way. We're working on um, a full portfolio of floor plans that range from you know, the bungalow with a couple of bedrooms up, a two story, and trying to help people see how do we take this space into a 40 foot lot or, or um, all the variety of lots that you're looking at and considering right now. Um, as far as our talk tonight, we're going to want to spend a little bit of time talking about some design trends on the mostly interior. We've got a few things for exterior, but mostly interior things. Um, we do have our three pillar designer, Brooke, and she's going to kind of um, chime in on some of the things that we'll be sharing with you. Um, maybe like help this situated here. So as far as starting from some uh, broad concepts on exterior, I think one of the things we want to pay attention to is taking the best of what Evans Farm is trying to be and implementing that from the exterior and then moving right onto the interior and paying attention to the architectural style and every detail that portrays that style. So we want to pay attention to front porch details. Um, we want to pay attention to the finished materials, the mix of the materials, the types of columns and styles that we're doing on those, and the front door. I, we think the front door is probably one of the single biggest impact places. We have these front porches, but front doors are going to be part of a statement um, that really sets the stage for the whole streetscape and for the community to come together and have that presence. Um, so when we look at this um, picture here, and it's a couple of, um, you'll see some of our pictures are of some finished homes tonight. You'll see some of our pictures of kind of the down and dirty, what's happening right now under construction around town from three pillar homeowners. Um, generally, all of these pictures are something you can see around town in, under construction today. Um, so if, if Brooke, you want to kind of walk us through a little bit of what we're looking at here when we talk about some of the exterior trends. Cedar stain porch on the top left. Um, cedar beam on the right with the painted front door. The one below is the contrasting dark bronze gutters, dark windows, uh, the dark bronze metal roof on the front porch, a smoky gray called Harbor Mist stain on the cedar beams of that house, and then a painted front door. The other one to the left is stained cedar, cedar beam corner, stain, stone columns, that was in Hills Village. Mm -hmm. So when we take homeowners to uh, design center experience, we start talking about exteriors. Uh, a lot of times people walk out there and think, gosh, I never even knew to ask about gutters. We knew that was part of the initial conversation about um, what we want to do. But it's, as you get into the details of the exterior, those will be the things that will set the stage. So thinking of contrasting colors in a gutter or having scuppers or having little touches that aren't all that expensive but add a lot of wow to that front elevation. All right. So here is a home we have under construction right now. And we think that this picture is clearly not finished. Um, what we want to showcase in this picture is a little bit about making a statement with things like uh, a chimney or a fireplace look that can go great in this traditional um, setting that we're going into Evans Farm. Is there anything else? So I'm going to remix three stones together and do a white butter joint. So instead of choosing just one style of stone, intermixing and having them pull from multiple um, uh, offerings to get a, uh, maybe a little more organic look and not so manufactured. Um, as far as this exterior goes, I think that it's a little bit difficult to see in the picture, but. We're taking a very much a white farmhouse look, but we've got multiple materials going on here. This is a painted brick on that main center gable of the house. Um, so when you approach that house, you feel that texture, you see that difference. Um, and then you've got the white siding and the um, vertical board into the garage base. 
Um, this is a homeowner that really wanted to take the idea of the two tone look, which is also something you've seen this in, in uh, modern homes or magazines right now, where you might have the perimeter in one color on cabinetry and the island in another color. Or we're starting to see a, bit, a little shift from that where you might see the base cabinets be one kind of color and the upper another kind of color. Um, the island is certainly a really nice opportunity, like in the last picture, to let it look like a piece of furniture. Let it, and again, that can inform bringing the, the architectural style of the exterior on and letting whether it's the corbels or the legs or some sort of detail that informs the exterior architectural style to the inside the kitchen island and let those two worlds play together a little bit. So two-toning cabinets is still very popular. Lots of um, things that you can see in the market that do that. Um, and when you do so, don't feel that the cabinets need to be the same manufacturer. Um, we're seeing people mix and match. We're seeing people do a hood that is uh, maybe a high-end custom-built hood, but not necessarily the whole kitchen in that same product line. So um, hoods are an important impact place and they're a place where you can spend a lot of money quickly, so you can then maybe go to uh, a less expensive product line in either another space in the kitchen, or in the messy kitchen, or in other cases, spaces in the house. Uh, um, so here's our, our classic white look going on, and Brooke, I, mean, I think there's a couple things you're going to say about that one, I can't remember. Typically, I would not mix the island with the perimeter being a different color and two separate countertops and two backsplashes mixed. But they were battling, it was a husband and wife. <laughs> she wanted a certain backsplash, he wanted one, so they compromised on that. And the same one with the cabinets. And it ended up turning out really nice. I was very nervous. But, yeah. <laughs> that, 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 that is tricky. Brooke brings up a good point. So, you know, as much as there's the ability to have some mix and match and don't feel that everything has to be the same, you can definitely go too far in that direction. So it's a safe bet to say if the cabinets are off from each other, maybe the countertops are a little more uniform, or if the countertop on the island is different from the perimeter, maybe the cabinets are more uniform. And you really want to spend a lot of time thinking, you know, closely if you start integrating multiple different countertops, different cabinets, Backsplash um, and letting that come together, looking at a lot of samples. Okay, um, this cat, this kitchen. I think I wanted to basically say to you, we still see the classic all-stained kitchen. We definitely see a color palette shift. You know, a little more gray undertones in the stain mix for sure. But a stained cabinetry is still something that gets a lot of requests, um, in part because of the livability. The, the being able to see things, if you actually cook in an all-white kitchen, you're cleaning that often. And so we get a lot of um, requests about, you know, if we do use our kitchen and entertain, this is something that we can maintain um, and look clean and nice on a daily basis. Um, in this kitchen, uh, a couple of things that I think lighten it up to not let it be too heavy is that they took the cabinets to the ceiling on the back wall there. Um, <coughs> In some areas, they have some highs and lows. So on the sidewall, they're not all the way up. And on the, um, the back wall, they are. So changing the heights of the cabinetry is a great way to add interest, especially when you're pulling in these 10 foot and 12 foot ceilings. Also adding some glass, get some reflective um, surfaces in there and allowing some light to shine through that. That also is something that you can never go wrong with. Don't feel like you have to stack all the way on the whole kitchen. Don't feel like you have to put glass everywhere. A couple of key places are great, easy ways to dress up the, the cabinetry. What else here, Brooke? Oh, that was um, another little risky backsplash. It was a four <laughs> by 16 <laughs> big cube If That was a, a, a bachelor. Single yeah. guy in this home. Yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, again, yeah, no, I like it. It's been up right now. Yeah. Um, I think another last thing I would say about cabinetry as we move on to a, a next look is what you want to do with the hood. So the hood is a, um, a, a central component to the cabinet question. Um, if we look at what's happening in here, there's a variety of hood styles. I will tell you that the hood in the top right corner is an unfinished hood. It's the one on the bottom. And then on the bottom right corner is that same hood finished. So tell us a little bit about that, Brooke, and, and what was the driver behind that? Um, to get a weathered metal look without paying for one. 
so we had the carpenter built the wood wood boat, and we had a guy come in and get a faux finish of paint on top of the wood and made a, the metal brackets. And then we just have a, a stainless steel hood with the kind of chimney look. Notice that the backsplash runs all the way up the wall with that when the, the stainless steel hood is there. Um, so that's one of those things that as you're starting to think through your kitchen layout, find out what you gravitate towards when you're looking at kitchen pictures, if you're on house, if you're on Pinterest. Um, if you keep picking up pictures over and over and over that have the stainless steel hood, that might inform you know, how you start out in your, your kitchen design. Um, uh, lots of other choices that the cabinet vendors can provide. The low um, profile hood on the left there, if I'm much. Um, okay, so as far as um, some, some details about backsplash in the kitchen, we get a lot of questions about what to do with backsplash. I think the, um, the big takeaway here is if you're really investing in cabinetry and in countertops, which are the bigger surface areas, and the spaces that you really um, get a lot of bang for the buck, then allow your backsplash to be a little simpler. You can still play with texture, but allow it to be a little bit more um, neutral and lasting and not too uh, crazy that it'll be so trendy that you'll be sick of it in a very short period of time. So it's a little bit hard to see what's going on here, but Brooke, maybe you tell us in the top left corner, what are we looking at? Top left is a three by six marble tile on a half offset. And I, I want to say we did four marble tops too. Mm -hmm. um, on the top right is a three by six herringbone pattern with a really soft gray grout. White cabinets were in that kitchen, white tops too. Um, bottom left is oh, everybody who works on computers right now, you're seeing that everywhere at the arabesque or lantern um, pattern. And then the one on the right is a three by six and a three by twelve wavy tile um, random install. So whether your tile is for a backsplash or any other space in the house, I think one of the things you want to um, explore is the way it gets applied. Um, so the installation that creates a pattern is sometimes all you need to do to create a little interest. Taking a subway tile and applying it on a herringbone pattern is a very cost-effective way to add a little touch of um, update or elegance without really investing heavily in that space, um, where hopefully you're investing in those cabinets or countertops a little bit more. Okay, I'm going to try and go a little faster here. Flooring, we're, I'm not going to talk about the slide, but I will kind of pop into the flooring. So in the flooring that you're looking at here, I think um, we still definitely see that for main house uh, living areas, hardwood flooring is, is dominating um, the offerings that people want. But within that space of hardwood floor, there's still a wide variety of, of what people are doing. Um, this particular slide, I just want to go, I think I have my hardwood flooring if I met. No. Um, this particular slide is more of the type of flooring that we're seeing in, in our bathrooms or in tiled spaces. Um, so quickly, Brooke, anything that you, you jumps out at you to sort of share what's going on in the top right versus the top left? Top right, 12 by 24 on third, mm -hmm. dark. So when, when she throws out those numbers, because I, I walk in sometimes with design, uh, as a design appointment with our homeowners, and they sort of glaze over when she starts throwing out all the sizes. But large format sizes are a way to really um, be on point or on trend for what are, what's happening in master bathrooms. However, um, they have a little bit more installation costs. They're usually a little bit more expensive than the smaller format. So when you go to your secondary bathroom spaces, that may not be where you want to invest. First of all, those bathrooms are often smaller. So by the time you go to a larger format tile, you have to cut it down just to get some of those fits anyway. So investing on a larger format tile, whether it's on the floor or on the wall in the master bath, is a really good bang for your buck, whereas not as much needed in the secondary space. Um, so I'm going to keep going here. So here is a place where we're starting to see people in mud halls or in connector spaces, want to do something different than the hardwood if they're not doing a continuous flow, but not necessarily always wanting to do with tile either. So what do we have going here, Brooke? Um, what was brought up earlier, three by uh, thin brick, which is in the front square over there, um, on a herringbone, 
Now, if you want to see thin brick on a herringbone, it just went in here and you go out the door to die. It's in. Yeah. Here. Yeah. Um, and then it's the black on the walls, mm -hmm. the cubby jar in the back, that powder room actually on the wall that you was done with Sharpie marker. It's like wallpaper. <laughs> it was. Yeah. Oh, no, yeah. Are you seeing the ship lab in the picture you've been looking at? Are you seeing it on ship? And go, yeah, okay. Good, good. Um, quickly, we're just playing with um, size and texture here. So what are some of the materials that you might call out as, as people are considering what they're using both? Top left is the brick that's in the front over here. We were able to see it in real life. The top right is a hexagon on a bathroom floor. Bottom left, that octagon dot that was going on the floor, three by six on shower walls, and then the 12 by 24 marble look tile was going in that shower as well. And then you have the wood look, which is very popular right now, wood look tile in bathrooms. You guys seen that? Uh, the tiles look like wood. So one thing we like to tell people, if you do um, go with a wood look tile, Brooke is always a big um, proponent of sharing this with our homeowners. That we don't want to put a wood-looking tile really up next to a, an actual wood floor. Um, those two things just don't play as well together. They kind of compete a little bit. So typically, we like to put that wood look in a space that's not necessarily buttressing right up to an actual wood floor. So if you're going to have a hardwood floor in your master bedroom, for example, you may not want to go with a wood-looking floor in your master bathroom. But if you're going carpet, this is a great look with um, a good lasting value to it. Um, on hardwoods, we are still seeing a mix of people that are choosing stained on site and engineered wood floors. But I think probably the hardest um, piece to overcome for people, there's still this old school mentality of, I want real wood that stained on site sort of trumps the engineered wood. But when you start shopping for this, you're going to see that depending on the product line and what you're looking at, engineered wood floors can oftentimes be dramatically more expensive than the stained on site or, or solid wood floor. So the driver of that is wood species, size of plank, um, certain, um, what else can you just say, certain thicknesses of the wood. Um, as far as making some choices around this, if you're looking at doing hardwood floors on the first floor, especially if you're looking on a smaller footprint or envelope of first floor plan, um, having a continuous floor that isn't interrupted, not changing the kitchen from the great room to, that's one way to give you sort of that expansive look of keeping it all continuous. But um, recognizing that the engineered wood floors that are being um, used today are in part helpful to our specific client. So even though tonight and in this room it doesn't feel like it's February 12 degrees out, but when we have that kind of climate or temperature change where we go from cold to hot, the um, wider the plank is on a 100% wood floor install, you're going to have some what we call um, cupping and gapping. So on the ends of the boards they'll cup up or they'll shrink and gap. And so that constant expansion and contraction of the wood on a wider plank is why none of the flooring people in Central Ohio want to install wider plank real wood floors because it doesn't take the change in temperatures. Whereas the engineered floors really lets us do that um, because the top layer is still a, still a real wood, but underneath it's, it's got some uh, material that allows it to expand and contract a little more nicely. Um, anything else on this? Okay, this I think is probably the most fun, but I didn't say so, but in flooring, um, that's one of the pieces you're gonna put in and it's gonna be there for a long time. And it's one that if you're thinking about the second place of investment after the kitchen, it's the flooring. It's the main flooring of the house. You can always continue to invest in the home with some of the details that we're about to show you now. These are the things that add character and specialty look and style and value. So we think a few of these out of the gate make a lot of sense, but if you have to decide on where to spend on your design dollars, your wood flooring on an expansive view is a good investment for a long-term play in the home. Um, okay, so some trim details. I'm going to go a little quickly because we're kind of running long on time, but you can see here we've got some built-ins with a, a real kind of farm look again. This is a great uh, picture 
picture to kind of talk about bringing the exterior look to the interior of the house. So if you're looking for a farmhouse look and bringing that element into the great room, this is, uh, I think it's a painted brick with a, you know, a very rustic but simple um, style of mantle with the floating shelves, um, but still has the functionality of the cabinetry. Um, here, we're seeing people really expand on their, what they want to do around fireplaces. So never, ever, ever stops to be a question of what to do with the TV, where does it go? And so that is probably really just boils down to a lifestyle preference. Are you wanting it in the center of the room? Do you want to put it over the fireplace and hold the firebox down? Don't feel a heart, drop that mantle so you're not craning your head too much to watch the television. If you want to um, put it on either side, make a specific plant. In this bottom right corner, their fireplace is raised, um, whereas I think the, the viewing of that would be a little more comfortable if the firebox was dropped down on the floor. But those barn doors that are above the mantle are the, the hiding of the TV there. So that can open up and the TV is behind the barn door. So whoever wins the battle of how big the TV is and the very end and all of that, we think the big, big TV should maybe go down there finished lower levels or bonus rooms, but, you know, everybody has their, their thing, so. All right, um, staircases. This is another place where your exterior style can inform what you're doing and also add some special um, touch and detail. I think the biggest takeaway here is kind of getting your arms around the built-on site staircase and the style of the posts. So you may bring the exterior posts and, and kind of um, things happening on your front porch and bring that sort of a style of profile to the inside of the house. Um, anything else, Brooke, that you would say here? Can trim up the stairs, maybe? Hmm? No? Maybe the knuckles off the iron. Those little stairs. So here are the knuckles off the wrought iron. A little decorative on the rails. Maybe going to simple classic with um, and getting out the decorative detail there. Um, Built-ins, so you see the, um, the built-ins are probably one of the most common built-ins that people do out of the gate in their new built homes in the mud hall arena because there is such a need for a drop zone. But then how those come together, whether they're all painted or they're stained, also just little tiny details, be creative. It doesn't have to be the stock you know, builder hook. Um, the hooks that are in these are, are um, unusual things. You could go to an antique place, or you could find some things that you can bring to give little touches of detail that make statements about the look or style you're going for. Exactly. Also notice that look for you that? I was laughed at and made fun of for those hooks, and now everybody wants them. They're railroad spikes, and I have a guy who bends them for me, and now everybody wants them. Mm -hmm. There you go, so railroad spikes. Um, uh, a little bit more detailing on just allowing yourself to dress up special spaces. If Evans Farm is meant to um, look back to a time of um, kind of traditional architecture, letting some of those little elements of, of traditional classical um, touches come into places like your doorknobs, your lighting, your um, the hardware that you use. It does not have to be matchy matchy though. This doesn't have to be whole house. This can be certain touches or spaces. So um, take away the idea that it's an all or nothing when you're looking at an option. Sometimes that makes it cost prohibitive, but if you can put a few touches in the daily wow spaces, probably worth worth the consideration. Um, any <coughs> custom mirrors, changing up from well, just yep, quartz countertops. We haven't seen that. Um, lighting is, I think, one of the things that our homeowners um, struggle with the most because of scale and also because it's a finish line piece that you're actually selecting the light fixtures deeper into the construction process than you are selecting cabinetry, flooring, and exterior styles. And so it's a run out of money time. You know, it's like, oh, more, more money. So at this point, you kind of, you tell people, first plan on some light in some wow key, key areas. So at the entrance of your home, in the kitchen, those are some areas that you want to feel special right away over the island. But when we talk about design and detail, some things in the secondary space that you can go back in and do a little bit later if it doesn't um, make the cut out of the gate, these would be spaces like in um, secondary bedrooms or a bonus room or uh, even the mass 
master where you're not necessarily parading your guests through yet and you want to change something out. So make sure you allow budget for light fixtures that um, gets your entry main floor um, well covered and your exterior light fixtures take consideration too. That would probably come earlier on when you're doing your exterior style. That is it. I made it through to the end. I hope you guys had a great evening, and I look forward to meeting you. My contact information. I think I've parted out here, and again, we have a model really close by. So, if you would like to talk to Brooke or myself and meet with, uh, we would love to have you. Thank you. Thank you. attempt at new urbanism. Um, Wait, I, I let, wanted me, to... let me introduce oh. Dan Griffin. He's, <laughs> our, he's a developer, a developer, one of our partners here. Oh. So uh, I wanted to let everybody 
everybody knows. So March 13th, we're, we're glad to do these education series. We're obviously educating everyone and ourselves. Um, and that's part of our goal, educating the community of uh, the and Tampa schools. We've got a good uh, scholarship program that we're doing. But March 13th, we're bringing in Bob Gibbs, uh, Michael Watkins, um, and a lady, I should say, a lady named Monica, I think Jefferson. They, Bob Gibbs and Mike Watkins, uh, Mike Watkins worked for Duwani, Clayter, and Tiber, which uh, they did Seaside. They did uh, Celebration, your, your way, your, and they did all of them. Um, so these two gentlemen and this lady who's the director of National Town Builders Association, New Urban and Town Building, uh, Bob Gibbs, Mike Watson are coming here the 13th at Nationwide. We're bringing them in. Um, we're doing charrettes for ourselves to learn more and just find detail of the community, even in the commercial village side. But um, that night, it'll be March 13th from 7. Uh, you can start getting there at 6.30. We'll be ready at 6, but uh, it starts at 7. They're going to do a two-hour seminar of questions and answers, um, really about the whole new urbanism um, march, which is all about relationships and community. It's throwing the keys on the, in the afternoon is when you get home and never have to get back in your car to do things and enjoy we have in our village, I just wanted to say this, and I don't know if you've already mentioned it, we already have 20 businesses that we are signing up to go in. And these are all local businesses, no chains, no Walmarts, everybody's only dancing. So we have restaurants, brew pubs, um, we've got the salons, the nail salons, and the whole, we have 20 businesses that are going to start this in 2017. So this village will be up. It won't be something that will come five, ten years down the road. So we're excited about that as well. But uh, March 13th is going to be a really fun evening to hear from the guys that, that really know what they're doing around the country and have done work on everything, as you, as you know. Anyway, thank you for coming. Really, appreciate it.